Welcome to today's Lunch and Learn webinar, Making the Case for a Warehouse Management System, or WMS, brought to you by ArcherPoint and HiJump. A successful warehouse management system implementation is in an unautomated facility can provide a rapid return on investment. A WMS also serves as a foundation for instituting a continuous improvement culture and facilitates ongoing annual benefits ranging from 5 to 10 percent. For some companies, justification in a WMS is a matter of survival. Having the right material at the, available at the right place and at the right time is no longer enough. The new requirements include compliance labeling, floor-ready displays, advanced ship notices, postponement, light manufacturing, and collaboration. However, despite all this, many companies are not ready to make the investment in a WMS and do not see the business case for doing so. This webinar will help provide a good foundation for a solid business case for procuring a warehouse management system. We're pleased to have Chris Barnes with us today. Chris is a supply chain advocate and visionary with HiJump. He has invested the past 20 years in manufacturing and logistics operations, where his practical engineering expertise has helped numerous clients improve their operations. He's a speaker and blogger on Lean Six Sigma, warehousing and distribution, warehouse management systems, materials management, and supply chain strategy. Barnes has authored numerous articles and white papers in a variety of well-respected publications, including Apex, The Performance Advantage, and Warehouse Management and Control System Desk Reference. Today, Chris will help you make the case for WMS at your company. Without further ado, Chris, over to you. Thank you, Suzanne. And to everyone listening, I appreciate you investing your time. And hopefully you will realize a great return. Uh, and speaking of return on investment, over the next 45 to 50 minutes, I will introduce ideas for, as Suzanne had suggested, justifying a warehouse management system, or WMS. We'll cover three areas. A brief discussion on why companies invest in WMS, a deeper dive into WMS value driver categories, and wrap up with other considerations for justifying and implementing WMS. There are a few solution types available for warehouse automation. At the low end, there are point solutions attempting to automate existing practices by overlaying existing processes with barcoding and data collection capabilities. The biggest risk with these solutions is they do not enable warehouse best practices. So you might just end up doing the wrong things only faster. Regarding doing the wrong things faster, management guru Peter Drucker said, efficiency is doing the thing right. Effectiveness is doing the right thing. At the upper end of the market are tier one WMS solutions, such as High Jump's Warehouse Advantage. These solutions offer the ability to leverage operational best practices, but typically are designed for more sophisticated high volume facilities and can take six to 12 months to implement. High Jump Warehouse Edge solution is built specifically for the small to medium sized business market, offering best of breed functionality to allow you to re engineer your processes. High Jump WMS can be up and running in as little as 90 to 150 days with a standard configurable design. As with any technology investment, you should first ask do I even need this solution? Regarding WMS, when the market first started in the late 20th century, Having a WMS was a significant competitive advantage. Now, however, having a WMS is basically a cost of doing business. Essentially, the more connected and extended a supply chain becomes, the greater the effect a WMS will have on the overall bottom line. This is especially true in the new global economy. If you're working in an extended supply chain, lack of WMS makes you a less valuable trading partner, meaning you are the weakest link. And there are various issues that WMS can address and specific operational characteristics where a WMS may be a fit. From an issues perspective, you might need a WMS if your order volumes are increasing, especially if this is the result of your customers ordering more frequently and in smaller quantities. Think just-in-time deliveries or e-commerce orders. 
your overall inventory values and or quantities are rising without an associated increase in overall revenues. If sales are not growing, higher inventory levels could be the result of lost or misplaced product. Customer complaints are on the rise, especially for misshipments. In general, your inventory record accuracy is on the decline. This is typical of more volume or activity in the warehouse and increasing space constraints. And if employee turnover is an issue, getting new people on board and up to productive rates can be a drain on your budget. From a facility operating characteristics perspective, you are a WMS candidate if you have at least 50,000 square feet of warehouse space, you have at least 10 warehouse employees with the majority being in the picking function, you have at least five dock doors, you have at least 5,000 SKUs to manage, or you have special inventory control requirements such as lot numbers, expiration dates, or serial number tracking. Like other operations, because you are consuming resources from the company and potentially asking for more, you should be measuring and managing against key performance indicators or KPIs. While different facilities will have different metrics, a good place to start defining KPIs is the Work DC Metrics Report by Georgia's own Dr. Carl Mandrot. You can contact Dr. Carl direct for more information on this report at carl.mandrot at gcsu.edu. If you're measuring against these KPI but not achieving the stated results, at least at the median level, investing in the WMS will help you. Regardless of how the system will be justified, it is important to manage all key stakeholder expectations. Also keep in mind there may be sacred cows around. For instance, claiming a reduction in inventory by implementing WMS may be double dipping from a promised inventory reduction from a previous system implementation. Because business case has much to do about numbers, you might be interested to know 111 million, 111,111 squared equals the very palindromic 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 8, 7, 6, 5, 4, 3, 2, 1. At a top level, there are three primary value drivers you should realize from using WMS. One, improved efficiencies around inventory utilization, labor productivity, and space utilization. Two, improved customer service levels in the form of on-time and accurate deliveries and being able to justify changing customer requirements. And three, real-time access to information to allow leadership to proactively manage operations. To drill down a bit further, when justifying a WMS, benefit savings can be broken down into tangible or hard dollars and intangible or soft dollars. Keep this in mind as you develop the business case to avoid inflating the benefits side. Next, we review various types of benefits associated to WMS projects, starting with the hard dollar or tangible benefits. Using WMS provides real-time inventory updates and improved inventory accuracy. Reducing the costs associated to inaccurate inventory records include poor buying practices and excess safety stock associated to buyer's lack of confidence in record accuracy, delays in order fulfillment associated to lost or misplaced product, lost sales due to stockouts or overcommitments, costs associated to placing and managing back orders, lower labor productivity associated to searching for lost product, and potentially higher freight costs resulting from expediting shipments to customers. With a good WMS and instilled operational discipline, you should expect 99.9 .9 plus percent inventory record accuracy. This will be the building block for other improvement opportunities. For a typical warehouse, the biggest cost benefit will become from a, an improvement in labor productivity. Direct and indirect labor benefits result from several areas. WMS maximizes the time operators spend adding value, filling orders, and receiving product. Both equipment and labor productivity will be improved with real-time information and system-directed tasks. This minimizes search time and dispatches operators to the appropriate tasks. And you may be able to eliminate functions, for example, with improved inventory record accuracy and in-process data validation, you should significantly reduce or eliminate pack station and outbound inspection requirements. Most of the information management requires will be available online versus stacks of paper reports. And administrative savings result from reduced data entry labor hours and reduced data entry errors 
through real-time entry of information. You should expect to improve labor productivity by 20 to 30 percent. This could result in doing more volume with the same amount of labor, reducing overtime and headcount, or both. Regarding labor savings, the majority of the savings is typically found in order picking, which accounts for at least 50% of the labor costs. Within the picking process, travel time can consume 50 plus percent of the time. WMS can help reduce wasted travel and search time associated with picking. In general, you should be able to practically eliminate time spent searching for lost inventory and improve pick labor productivity. Speaking of picking, the type of pick process you use is driven by cost, handling characteristics, and order profile. Being able to match the right pick process to the right order profile will result in improvements. If you do nothing else coming out of this session, I encourage you to understand your order profiles by analyzing six to 12 months worth of order history and develop an order distribution graph similar to this chart for your operations. Then begin to think about how you can manage to each order type. This is an example from a customer where we analyzed six months of data. The data revealed nearly 30% of their orders were for single line, single unit, and 75% of the orders were for five or fewer lines. This gave them a new perspective on how to manage and pick orders. In the omni-channel supply chain, a typical wholesale distributor warehouse will have at least two to three different order types or profiles. This table is from an example high jump customer who sells through their own web store to miscellaneous distributors and through large big box retail centers. We see 15% of the orders are medium sized, multi-line, 35% of the orders are for big box replenishment and 50% are typical e-commerce single line, single unit orders. Knowing this information will help you define optimal pick workflows. Next, we'll discuss a few of these pick workflows. Discrete order picking is the most common and the easiest to implement and manage. Essentially, one picker works on one order until complete. Batch pick helps reduce travel time by grouping line item picks from multiple orders together. If one item goes to four orders, enough of the item for all four orders is picked in aggregate while at the bin. The items are then sorted at a subsequent process. A variation on batch picking is cluster picking. However, this is time the operator will take multiple cartons, one for each order, on a cart and put the product into each carton as picked. This minimizes average travel time per pick, but adds complexity to the pick process. Here are a couple example cluster pick carts where customers can pick up to 18 orders on the left and nine on the right. When designing a cluster pick process, consideration needs to be given to the trade-offs between reduced travel time and excess handling requirements. At some point, there will be diminishing marginal return on cluster size, and you will need enough space in your aisles of the layout if you intend to use pick carts like those shown earlier. Another pick strategy, zone picking, has multiple pickers processing picks from their own assigned zone or area from the same, for the same order, then moving the items to a pack station where they are consolidated into a shipping case. This might help if you are picking large Amazon orders with a short delivery lead time where you can pick in parallel rather than in series. Other things driving labor productivity improvements are pre-posting and pre-routing sales orders prior to picking. Pre-posting is the process of making certain the inventory is available in the pick bin prior to sending the operator to do the pick. Pre-routing is the process of mapping out the pick travel path to reduce wasted motion and travel during the pick tour. These two practices will save you significant time and effort during the pick process, but it's challenging and e to efficiently execute without WMS support. Let's show an example of pre-routing improvements by using a grocery shopping list. You might have items on the shopping list in random order. Sometimes you develop the list based off of when you realize you needed the product. There is no rationale. At this point, the list serves the purpose of a memory jogger to remind you what to buy on the next trip to the store. Next, we look at the flow of picking the as-is grocery list. If you pick the list as-is, the pick path in the grocery store would resemble Walk in, find the milk, next go to the pickles, from there find the bread, eggs are next, Coca-Cola for the weekend, and got to have some high jump WMS, and finally proceed to checkout. From a bird's eye view, I expect you can always, you can see ways to improve this flow. 
sorting lists based on travel sequence or pre-routing will make the pick tour much more efficient. Walk in, find the Coca-Cola, bread, pickles, high jump WMS, milk, eggs, and proceed to checkout. You might agree this is much more organized and efficient. And it works well if you want to keep the milk and eggs refrigerated as long as possible. But can you think of an example why this concept might need some tweaking? Well, if you're going to buy a lot of soda, you might want to get this last to keep to, ha to have from keeping to move the heavy load around the store. But you probably don't want to stack the soda on top of the bread and eggs. Whatever your rationale, these same principles and considerations apply when planning your warehouse layout and picking strategies. Next, I'll discuss another productivity driver that can save you up to 66%. A common term you'll hear in warehousing best practices is slotting or profiling. Slotting is defined as the process of identifying the most efficient placement for each item in a distribution center. Since each warehouse is different, proper slotting depends on a facility's unique product, movement, and storage characteristics. An optimal slotting plan allows workers to pick items more quickly and accurately and reduces the risk of injuries. Slotting uses ABC profiling, 80-20 analysis, and cube movement data to keep high-moving products in the golden or strike zones. Benefits of slotting strategy include improved picker productivity, better pick accuracy, more efficient replenishments, ability to better manage the workload across the facility, and improved ergonomics and safety. Next, we'll show an example of a product slotted warehouse. Slotting attempts to keep fast moving or A items closer to the point of use with slower moving B and C items further away. In this warehouse, A items would be slotted or stored closer to shipping and in easily accessible bins, B items further away, C items the furthest away of all. With the ABC slotting design theory in mind, what is the best shape of a warehouse? To keep all product equally distributed around the shipping dock, the warehouse would be a circle with shipping in the center and products slotted in a bullseye around the dock. Of course, the underground tunnels required to get to the shipping dock might be cost prohibitive. Here's an example of how a slotting strategy can reduce travel time and save you money. We start with a 1,000 foot long building with shipping on the left. Without a slotting strategy, product is randomly stored throughout the facility and the average pick travel distance is 1,000 feet, 500 feet in, 500 feet out, occurring 100% of the time. With slotting, let's define A items as 20% of the items, generating 80% of the activity and consuming roughly 20% of the space. Average travel distance for A atom picks is 160 feet, 100 feet in, 100 feet out, occurring 80% of the time. B items are defined as the next 30% of the items, driving 15% of the activity and consuming the next 30% of the warehouse. Average travel distance for B item picks is 105 feet, 350 feet in, 350 feet out, occurring 15% of the time. And C items will be the remaining 50% of the items driving 5% of the activity and consuming 50% of the space. Average travel distance for C item picks is 75 feet, 750 feet in, 750 feet out, but only occurring 5% of the time. In total, the average travel distance to pick with a slotted layout is 340 feet, 160 plus 105 plus 75 for a savings of 66% per pick. Slotting is something you can do without WMS support, and I imagine many of you are already slotting if only on a limited or mental basis. However, a solution like High Jump WMS will automate the analysis process and help with slotting execution. As your warehouse becomes larger and begins to fill, it may be more difficult for material handlers to find empty bins to store product. If you find your operators driving around excessively, they are either moonlighting with Uber or searching for available storage bins. Either way, they are not providing value to your budget. You should see a labor productivity improvement using the directed put away functionality in the WMS. Directed put away uses ladder logic to survey the warehouse for all available storage bins and suggest the best bin for the product. 
Additionally, directed put away will help ensure product is stored in the appropriate environments, for example, hazmat, cold storage, and secured storage. This will help you reduce product spoilage from being stored in the wrong temperature, will help you reduce shrinkage associated to high value product, and will help you maintain compliance with government regulations. Another area, area you may be able to eliminate the function is EDI processing. In many non-automated warehouses that take on providing EDI data for customers, the company may end up adding labor to print, manage, and enter data into an EDI translator. Using a good WMS will essentially build EDI data packets as part of the pick and pack workflow. Then all you need to do is print the UCC labels, apply the carton and the ship orders, and then everything else is done behind the scenes. This both reduces labor requirements and eliminates costly chargebacks from your customers due to non-compliance. One final topic on improving labor productivity is hands-free picking. Whatever you can do to free the picking operator's hands and allow them to focus on the pick workflow, you will see a direct benefit. For example, voice picking is a proven hands-free solution that should not only improve pick labor productivity, but also improve pick accuracy. While voice picking applications can be implemented as standalone solutions, having a WMS with an integrated voice picking module will increase the ROI of both. To see voice pick in action and a high level comparison of scanning, check out the brief five minute video on YouTube, Voice Picking versus RF Scanning by Vitek Business Group. Next, let's shift gears and discuss savings associated to inventory reduction. With better inventory accuracy and short lead times, you may be able to reduce inventory levels in the warehouse. However, many warehouse operations will have little impact on the amount of inventory they have. They are told how much they will receive from purchasing and how much will be shipped from sales. There are many reasons for keeping excess inventory, including customer satisfaction, having complete product lines, lead time uncertainty. For example, I have several customers that will have full warehouses at the start of the year due to the Chinese New Year celebration, and they're planning around shipping delays. And a less strategic reason for having excess inventory is, is for example, management bonuses might be impacted by excessive inventory write-offs. So the inventory probably won't go away anytime soon. But these reasons should be compared to the cost of carrying the excess inventory. If you do claim this tangible benefit associated to using a WMS, you could target a 15 to 30 percent reduction in inventory. Regarding carrying costs, a more efficient warehouse can also have a positive impact in this area. A more efficient warehouse could result in lower inventory levels impacting inventory investment, insurance, and taxes. WMS could also reduce overall storage requirements resulting in less money spent on third-party warehouses and potentially company-owned or leased facilities. And better inventory management should result in less obsolescence. If you decide to claim an inventory reduction, consider there is a one-time benefit associated with a reduction in working capital requirement from not buying as much and an ongoing carrying cost benefit associated with having less inventory. The higher the carrying cost factor for your company, the more the potential ongoing savings you can realize. Improved inventory accuracy results in potential better inventory turns. As seen here, this can have a positive impact on carrying costs. Over time, with better inventory accuracy, supported by real-time and automated cycle counting, you may be able to eliminate the process of taking a physical inventory. Along with having a direct impact on the corporate balance sheet, Removing the physical count process eliminates costs associated with shutting down the facility to control inventory movements, paying staff overtime for taking the physical inventory, which typically happens over a weekend and involves additional management and thank you donuts, and may involve resources not familiar with the warehouse. And potential delays in shipping orders, although this should not be an issue with effective management. Next, let's discuss improvements associated to shipping. The integrated high jump warehouse solution works with the high jump one shipping functionality to ensure complete orders are being shipped on time with correct information. If shipping errors are high and frequent, the company might be penalized by the customer for missed shipments. Some of your retailer customers may use this as a profit center. As we mentioned earlier, the real time building of EDI packets will help eliminate compliance issues. A worse scenario is missed shipments could eventually result in lost business. 
And there are also costs associated to correcting the errors. With a good WMS and well-planned shipping process, expect at least 99.9 .9 plus percent shipping accuracies. Using an integrated shipping system with your warehouse management system will allow more flexibility in shipping options. For example, the automatic data capture device or handheld scanner used for data collection can also be used as a mobile shipping station. This will allow you to enter basic ship data from a mobile device and reduce shipping sta ship station space requirements. And for certain types of orders, for example, single line, single unit orders shipped via parcel carrier, the ship process can be fully automated. As an example, when the order is released for picking, the parcel ship label is printed, the label is applied to the ship carton and the product is picked directly into the ship carton. And when the pick is complete, the ship carton is taped and set onto the carrier pallet on the ship dock. This allows you to eliminate the need to repack the carton and reduce pack and ship station space requirements. Regarding space requirements, overall better planning and performance typically results in improved space utilization, resulting in avoiding the need to expand or use offsite storage. You may not be able to reuse or resell one aisle of extra space, but having this space available for peak season and temporary storage makes for a more efficient operation. Rewarehousing will help free up space by more effectively identifying partial full locations that could be consolidated, and better planning and product information will allow for using different bin sizes. Having flexible picking options found in a good WMS will allow you to set up a warehouse within a warehouse. In this concept, case quantities are picked from bulk or flow racks, and each quantity is picked from smaller bin shelving. This will allow you to get more picks in a smaller area, resulting in faster order throughput, reduced pick errors, and overall better labor productivity. And having these smaller areas is generally easier to manage. A concept closely aligned to the warehouse within a warehouse is forward pick and reserve storage. Using a forward pick strategy helps keep a smaller volume of inventory and easily accessible bins or forward pick with the overstock in remote bins or reserve storage. In this strategy, the most popular items are stored in forward pick bins in small amounts, typically measured in days on hand. So order picking can be concentrated within a relatively small area. This reduces average pick travel time and distance and is generally easier to supervise. The trade-off is the forward pick bins must be replenished from the bulk storage or reserve area elsewhere in the warehouse, where inventory levels could be measured in weeks or months on hand. A typical forward pick area for small parts is an aisle or more of carton flow racks that are easily replenished. Because it is relatively inexpensive to pick from the forward pick area, the space is particularly valuable. When creating a forward pick zone, consider the space may become congested with picking operators as more picks are concentrated in a smaller area. You might counter this effect by putting the highest moving items in multiple bins spread out within the zone. As mentioned, using a forward pick strategy helps keep a smaller volume of inventory in easily accessible bins forward pick with the excess stock in remote bins reserve storage. This could be also done by placing the forward pick bins on the lower levels of selective racks with all overhead selective racks used for reserve storage. You might visit a Lowe's or Home Depot store in the States to get an idea of this type of storage. And when the forward pick bins reach a minimum defined inventory level, a replenishment from reserve storage to forward pick bins needs to occur. And as discussed, forward pick and reserve storage needs to be supported by a solid replenishment strategy. A productivity drain in the warehouse results when an operator goes to a bin to, to perform a pick and there is not enough product in the bin for the operator to complete the task. On average, it takes four times as long to pick a product that is not there than to pick a product from a bin with enough inventory. If you think about it, when an operator goes to a bin for a, for a pick and there's not enough inventory, what happens? First, they look at the pick list a couple times to recheck and make sure they are in the correct bin and looking for the correct product. Next, they might search behind the pallet. They might look to the bin on the right and the bin on the left until they finally give up and call the supervisor, which creates yet another productivity drain, and finally move on to the next task. All of this is wasted time. If you're going to use forward pick, make certain to have a supporting replenishment strategy, which is part of a good WMS.
Next, consider how much you could save if you didn't put product away and or pick inventory from storage bins. Cross-docking is a logistics procedure where products from a supplier or manufacturing plant are distributed directly to a waiting sales order with marginal to no, no handling or storage time. You can potentially reduce storage requirements and improve overall labor productivity by moving product from the receiving dock direct to an outbound order. This practice is best supported with some form of technology to match inbound receipts with open outbound orders. WMS can help you improve equipment utilization by ensuring the correct type of material handling equipment is being used, optimizing space being consumed to store and or maintain equipment, and ensuring your equipment is properly maintained. As an example, here's a checklist from High Jump One's inspection module you could use to update maintenance records and extend equipment life. High Jump One Inspection is a fully integrated freeform questionnaire toolkit you can use to create checklists and decision trees for various processes. You might plan for an improvement in the equipment utilization from 5 to 20 percent. There are other potential areas where WMS can have a tangible benefit. Sales could potentially improve with better inventory availability. Fewer sales will be lost due to unmet commitments. Better planning and performance in the warehouse will result in fewer unplanned receiving and shipping delays, which lowers transportation demerge charges. Better planning and inventory visibility will reduce the need for warehouse created rush orders and associated operational disruptions. And moving to an RF driven environment can reduce the need for paper documentation in many areas, for example, receiving, put away and picking. As you develop a business case for warehousing or any other project, keep in mind more is not always better. Attempting to include too much of a tangible benefit or too many intangible benefits could result in a poorly received return on investment analysis. Next, we'll review some of the intangible benefits you might consider for the WMS business case. In a paper-based warehouse, errors associated to data entry or fat fingers are prevalent. I've seen an estimate that one in every 300 keystrokes results in an error. Compare this to the RF data collection accuracy that results in one MISC scan or error per million scans. WMS can have an impact on customer service levels, resulting in retained customers, acquiring more customers, and reducing costs associated to poor customer service. For example, the VP of Ops for an aftermarket auto parts distributor stated, it costs us approximately $600 per order error. And that is just the internal cost. When you add in the cost to our customers, the number nearly doubles. As you're processing transactions through the warehouse, you should be able to tap into the data provided to help you understand the operations and more importantly, proactively manage change. I Jump One Pulse is a fully integrated operational insight tool, allowing you to turn your data into usable information in the form of key performance indicators, pivot grids, and both reactive and proactive alerts. Pulse can span the applications you use within your extended enterprise. With its open connectivity layer, Pulse will pull KPI data from different parts of your operation, like your warehouse management function, the partial shipping operation, your EDI trading partner network, and even your ERP system. High Jump WMS also has a statistics display on various screens allowing management to plan labor requirements. And there are over 45 standard reports you can use to help better manage operations and visualize employee productivity. Pulse can also trigger two types of alerts. Event-driven or reactive alerts are generated when information is entered, changed, or deleted in the database. For example, when a sales order is picked or a purchase order is received. Proactive alerts are generated when something doesn't happen. For example, when a scheduled receipt does not arrive, when an order is not shipped by 5 p.m., or when an operator does not perform a task for 10 minutes. Alerts can be delivered to the alert dashboard through email or text messaging to both individuals and groups. With real-time visibility into activities, workload management can be used to balance the flow of activity across the warehouse. This helps minimize the impact of process bottlenecks, resulting in more efficient operations. WMS may also allow the company to implement best practices required by their customers or that may benefit their customers. For example, value-added services such as kitting and light assembly could allow a company to implement a postponement strategy and event triggers can be set up to issue messages to partners in the supply chain. 
There are several other intangible benefits you can consider, but at this point, it's becoming more difficult to quantify dollar savings. For example, having a common WMS in multiple facilities will result in standard procedures, or what I call the McDonald's effect, with shared support across the facilities. Employee satisfaction should improve as their work becomes more efficient and they might be less tired at the end of their shifts. Also, employee skills should improve as they begin to learn and work with new technology, making them more valuable to the company. With real-time tracking of tasks and labor, both inventory and orders flow more fluidly through the facility and without being lost or misplaced. With more efficient operations, order cycle times might be reduced, meaning your company might be easier to do business with, or at least you might be able to deliver the order more quickly. And the company and employees might benefit from participating on a customer advisory board or in other general user networking with other companies. As a final topic, when discussing anything to do with the warehouse, it is difficult not to mention Amazon and the impact they're having on the industry. If you're fortunate or unfortunate, depending on your perspective, to be working with Amazon, you're probably aware of the operational challenges to remain compliant. But fear not, there are ways a good WMS can help you. For example, High Jump WMS can streamline the process for working with Amazon Vendor Central. When working with Vendor Central, you might be required to apply pro bill and routing information on carton labels. But the carton contents and weight is required to get the pro bill and routing information from Vendor Central. It's the classic chicken and egg paradox. The process might look like this. Pick the order. Collect carton contents and weight information. Go to Vendor Central Porter, Portal to enter the carton shipment information. Print the ship labels. Go back to the load and take the time to search and match the labels to the correct cartons. Then ship the order. With High Jump WMS, it's possible to streamline this workflow by first determining the carton contents and weight in advance of the pick by using what we have as an anticipated carton requirements or ACR report. The ACR report is a standard SQL Server reporting services report tool used to identify outbound carton requirements and specific carton contents in advance of orders being released for picking. The new workflow using the ACR report might look like this. Run the ACR, ACR report in High Jump. Go to Vendor Portal to enter the carton shipment information. Print the carton ship labels. Pick the order and apply the ship labels during the pick flow and ship the order. This approach could significantly reduce time spent searching and physically matching labels to cartons, resulting in improved throughput capacity. Amazon Seller Fulfillment Prime provides the benefits of selling through Amazon while leveraging your existing distribution expertise and retaining additional margins for your company. However, the Seller Fulfillment Prime requirements can quickly erode those additional margins. Seller Prime requires shipping using Amazon carriers, rates, and labels. To get this information typically means incorporating the Seller Central Porter portal into your workflows, or in other words, additional labor requirements for your business. For example, to ship an Amazon Prime order, once the order is picked, you will need to go to the Seller Central Porter portal, maybe on a dedicated workstation, then select Buy Shipping, enter or update the order shipping information, Select the best service type, select the right label format, buy and confirm the shipping you want to use, then download and print the shipping label, and apply the labels to the shipping carton. Most of this is extra work you weren't doing before. Alternatively, using a fully integrated WMS and shipping application, you will be able to incorporate the Seller Central interface into your standard pick, pack, and ship workflow, essentially allowing you to automatically communicate with Seller Central and bring back the preferred ship info all seamless to the user with minimal workflow impacts. Let's conclude with a quick discussion on how to chart the benefits and manage change. Once the potential benefits for the in initiative are identified, they can be charted based on their characteristic and potential management responsiveness to help define which benefits could be included in the business case. From my experience, area one are the benefits typically included in all business cases. Area two are the benefits considered on a case-by-case -case basis. And area three are the benefits that are hard to quantify and probably will not make the cut. 
from a planning and change management perspective, there may be a predictable drop-off in performance due to the implementation of a new process or, or system. The response is a natural reaction to major change. Target performance can be achieved by proactively managing this change. Managing expectations means letting all involved know things might get worse before they get better. As with any change, implementing WMS might result in an immediate drop-off in operational performance due to many factors, including unexpected process results, misdefined procedures, and employee learning curve effects. The key to consider is to plan for this drop-off when calculating the project payback period. Effective project and change management will increase the speed of adoption and increase proficiency, minimizing the severity of initial lost performance. Once the project has realized steady state, you can then begin to implement continuous improvement activities to further drive benefits. And a phenomenon I've seen in some projects is, is, is productivity actually improving during the project design phase before the solution is even implemented. This is generally the result of the Hawthorne effect, where people tend to perform better when they feel they are being observed. Your job is to efficiently manage change and these variables throughout the duration of the project. In summary, a good WMS will provide an excellent payback, but will depend on your operating characteristics and willingness, willingness to adopt best practices. If you're asked for your elevator pitch on WMS value drivers, I would encourage you to emphasize three things. One, improved efficiencies around inventory utilization, labor productivity, and space utilization. Two, improved customer service levels in the form of on-time and accurate deliveries and being able to satisfy changing customer requirements. And three, real-time access to information to allow leadership and management to proactively manage operations. As a call to action, I encourage you to start identifying the potential savings areas for your operation and use the High Jump SMB Savings Calculator to estimate your projected benefits. You can get this tool by contacting your Archer Point rep or going to the High Jump website and downloading. Uh, I'll just take a few minutes here to kind of show you the tool. Um, so the tool represents projected savings and a very high level net present value or NPV analysis based on data provided by you uh, using some of the areas we discussed earlier. You start by entering your general company information, specifically uh, projected annual growth rates, the projected planning horizon, the discount rate uh, for the net present and value analysis, and your labor burden rates. You can also enter the general pick type of, of your facility. This will impact the, uh, the aggressiveness of the NPV analysis, which we can use, uh, we'll talk about in a moment. You can also uh, next start entering your hourly warehouse, clerical, and customer service uh, rates within your, within your operations. And the next enter average order statistics associated to picking and receiving. You can also factor in peak season if you have one, but at a minimum enter the number of sales and purchase orders uh, you expect uh, per day. Uh, next, you can then scroll down and enter warehouse staffing by function for average and peak season. And if you're still uh, taking a physical inventory uh, count every year, um, you can enter the variable here. Uh, the number of counts per year, resources involved, length of account, um, et cetera. And you can enter missed shipment information here, both the quantity per day and associated cost uh, per missed shipment. And finally, if you're providing EDI transactions to your customers, you enter the resources involved and any current compliance fines that you might have here. Uh, from there, with that information entered, we can then go to our analysis page uh, where we can look at the calculations and we can view the savings results. Uh, it's important to note we represent, we present two savings analysis. The first is a, a conservative approach where we include only the low hanging fruit functions and cost easily, that can easily be uh, quantified and eliminated. Uh, things like packing and checking, uh, shipping, general data entry, and EDI labor. Uh, the base model assumes eliminating these functions, but you can change the percentages uh, that you want to eliminate either 100%, 50%, uh, 25%, et cetera, et cetera. You can estimate those savings here. And the conservative analysis also factors in eliminating misshipments and compliance fines. The second analysis is, uh, is a bit more aggressive and looks at labor productivity improvements around picking and receiving put away uh, while blending in the other general benefits. In this analysis, we provide general improvement assumptions around the workflows based on our experience and industry standards. 
You can also modify these assumptions up or down based on your specific operations. Uh, so there's a place to go in and modify the percent benefits that you expect specific to your operations. Uh, there are things like, uh, at, at, let me scroll down at the bottom. Uh, we, can, we can add factors in for some of the soft savings based on uh, expectations of, of management responsiveness. So things like reduce lost sales, um, looking down here a little bit further, reduce lost sales, reducing demerge charges associated to waiting trailers, savings that you might expect from an improved space utilization. Uh, and if this is not enough, there are other areas or lines that you can add in your other savings areas uh, that you might think you're going to benefit from your facility. Uh, both analysis output on annual savings and a projected NP and net present value uh, statistic based on your corporate guidelines. But keep in mind, this is a very rough analysis, especially on the NPV calculation, and should be firmed up with someone uh, from your finance team. And chances are they may have their own savings tool that they prefer to use, but you should be able to extract data from this tool as input to any corporate tools that you might be using. Uh, now to conclude, we'll open it up to any questions, uh, criticisms, or cannonballs that you might have uh, for us. Uh, but thank you for your time. Hey, Chris, thanks so much. Uh, we do have a few questions coming in. And for those of you that maybe haven't already typed your questions in, just go to your GoToWebinar console and click the drop down next to questions and type it in there. Let me pull up our first question. Do we have to implement process changes to realize savings with the WMS? Uh, do we have to implement process changes? Uh, generally, no. Um, but as I said before, if you if you put technology over bad practices, you'll just end up doing the wrong things faster. Um, but as, as seen in the savings calculator, there are some functions that may be eliminated just inherently. So so things like packing and checking requirements, um, general data entry, uh, EDI labor uh, data entry, those things will probably go away. Um, but just keep in mind, you, you're part of what you're buying is other other best practices that other companies that have, have bought the solution over 20 years uh, have implemented. So, so things like forward pick and reserve storage, cluster picking, uh, pick to ship label, those would be things that would be easily uh, put in, into practice. Great, thanks. Next question is, in today's market or in the environment, why are, why, what are the reasons you're seeing customers buy WMS? Uh, well, most of it's, today it's being driven, well, it's a, pretty much cost of doing business. I think the labor costs are going up. Um, I don't know. I've had a recent customer um, tell me that they, they're they near an Amazon distribution center. When, when Amazon opened up their operations, they saw their labor cost rose $5 across the board just because of the competition. So with that type of increase in your operating budget, you need to, you need to see some type of automation to help lower costs. The other thing is the uh, customer compliance. Uh, so if you're dealing with people that have specific labeling requirements, data, maybe UCC 128 labels, you need to be able to get those in place or else it's going to start costing you. And then the, the whole e-commerce boom and the Amazon effect is having a tremendous impact on, you know, companies that used to ship pallets and cases are now being required to ship each. That is a big change driver. Great. Thank you for that. Um, the next question, uh, where do you see the majority of the savings come from when implementing uh, WMS? Uh, majority of the savings, just without anything else factored in, uh, it's going to come from labor, uh, labor savings. Uh, and generally, that, that's because a majority of a warehouse operating budget is, is driven by labor. Um, and a majority of the labor component is driven by uh, outbound picking. So whatever, that's why I mentioned whatever we can do to reduce uh, operator dead travel time, uh, improve their picking accuracies while they're there. Um, that's going to have the biggest impact. So I would say if I had to be very specific, pick labor productivity is the biggest boom. Got it. Uh, next question is, how does your solution help with compliance labels? Yeah, we're seeing a lot of that today uh, in, in this market, but the D WMS can generate compliance labels at various points in the pick process. As I, I highlighted earlier for e-commerce type of orders, we can pre-print the shipping label so we can print labels at the point uh, before we even start picking the order. But even on the back end, um, a lot of times you need to have specific label formats with specific data in specific places on the on the label. And being able to print those out at the right, basically just before you need them as opposed to in advance. I've seen a lot of warehouses there, they have thousand labels when I walk in and they got to sort the labels. They have to uh, uh, 
sort the labels. They had to find the right cartons to put the labels on. So what we try to do is print the labels um, exactly at the point that you need them to apply them to the carton. And that's all done through the data collection process. So we're collecting the data or as we pick the orders. And then that data stays within the system and we just print out. We either can either print it out on a UCC label. We can also save it as data packets to send through EDI. Excellent. Does, uh, does the high-jump WMS only work in e-commerce environments? Yeah, I was, as I was going through presentation, I noticed I kept uh, talking about e-commerce. I did say e-commerce now because that seems to be the buzz. Uh, no, m many of our, our customers um, uh, on the WMS side are, are wholesale distributors. Uh, some are in even on the production side where they're doing uh, raw materials and finished goods tracking. Uh, but e-commerce is just the newest, the hottest, greatest thing right now, but it really works with wholesale distribution. Uh, if you're creating pallets and shipping out truckloads, even LTL uh, with cases. But I think most people, uh, they shouldn't be so myopic in their view, even if they're only doing cases today. I would say it's only a matter of time before they start looking at e-commerce. Even if they don't do their own e-commerce, they may be doing drop ships for, for, their other, for their customers, which is a form. Good point. And what's the main, main difference you see between e-commerce and traditional distribution? Uh, that's a that's a whole nother webinar. Um, <laughs> I, I think it's I think it's two things. One uh, it definitely is smaller order sizes, and um, the other is order predictability. Uh, and the, the first one we spoke about is smaller orders and more frequently. But you need to be able to efficiently pick the small orders. Like, like I said, it's a couple times single line, single unit types of orders. Um, and regard, regarding the order predict predictability, I don't think you can really depend on seasonal spikes as the main demand drivers anymore. I mean, wholesale distributors have traditionally seen spikes around holidays, maybe back to school uh, season. But with e-commerce, uh, for example, it's hard to tell when customers will buy. Um, however, even with e-commerce, uh, customers, they can they can plan for micro spikes within the week. Uh, for example, many of our e-commerce customers obviously see, see, see busy ship days on Monday and Tuesday to satisfy uh, what, I'll call, what I kind of call the, the weekend couch shoppers uh, with demand tapering off uh, as they get closer to the, the weekend. And that's good. All right. Um, next question is, if we're going to make layout changes, when should they be done? Well, as you may have guessed throughout this uh, webinar, I, I'm a big fan of improving processes, not only implementing technology for the sake of implementing technology. I started off with saying, if you know, just putting technology over bad practices, you're just going to be doing the wrong things faster. So I do like the idea of making layout changes as well as other process changes. But um, I would caution just if you're, if you're seriously looking at a warehouse management system to call, don't make any layout changes until after you've selected the solution and gone through, it's probably within the first week or two, gone through a business process review. So I mentioned it, it, it takes about 90 to 150 days to implement uh, the high jump WMS that we're talking about. And much of that time depends on your ability to get key milestones and sign-offs. Sign um, but you're going to end up uh, making physical layout changes. But again, I suggest that you wait until you meet with your implementation team to kind of find out what changes are possible. And then, because I'd hate for you to make a, a layout changes just to have to remake them again six months later. That, uh, it's a good time for this next question. What's the cost to implement High Jump WMS? Cost is, uh, I guess, I don't want to sound like a consultant, but it depends. Um, there's obviously a, a software and a services component, um, along with other general project costs like printers, handheld scanners, the servers, et cetera. Um, and High Jump, the, the solution we've been talking about, where it's provided on a, a value basis, meaning we have many modules, so that some of them I talked about, that you can either implement or not implement, and we, we kind of base that on uh, what we expect your ROI is going to be from, from using the module. Uh, for example, directed put away is an optional is an option uh, for smaller warehouses, but they may not need it because you know everybody knows where everything is. But as your facilities grow, they become more complex. Um, it may be harder to find place to put product away. As I said before, if people are driving around, uh, they're either working for Uber or they they can't find a place to put product. So so this is a the modularity approach is pretty unique to the industry. Um, but for a more specific answer on the costing, I, like I said, I don't want to give a, a wrong answer. Um, I encourage you to reach out to your, either your Archer Point rep uh, for more detail, or you can you know feel free to shoot me a note. And then, how is the solution licensed? 
again, license, it's kind of similar to the, the costing thing, but it's typically licensed, uh, well, two modules. Um, everything's being driven to the cloud these days, so we do have a, a cloud solution. It's pretty much driven by, by user, uh, so we can have a public cloud, private cloud. We can do the hosting for you. Um, but also on-premise solutions uh, for some of our older school companies. Uh, we license it by handheld user um, and even by, by admin user. So if you're going to be going in, looking at uh, planning, uh, releasing orders, uh, that's an admin user. And then most of the work that occurs in the warehouse, so picking, receiving, uh, that would be a handheld user. So it's, it's, it's either... It typically depends on your, your implementation strategy. Um, here's another question. What is the architecture like, or how does it work with the with the ERP? Uh, with the ERP, well, it's um, that's a good question because it is a separate database. It's a Microsoft SQL uh, backend database. So it's the reason that it, I think it's a best practice because most uh, ERPs, because I'm talking about the WMS communicating with an ERP here. Uh, so most ERPs don't have the uh, the database structure to support high volume transactions. And let me see, I might have a slide here. Here's one. So um, in terms of what we do, so so the warehouse management system is the back end uh, database here, and we communicate through interfaces with your ERP system. So your ERP would manage the uh, the purchase orders, your vendor information uh, on the inbound side and the outbound side. Your ERP would manage. Uh, you would enter in orders, sales orders, and customer information through your ERP, and then the, the warehouse management system is a separate database. We have the interface. Uh, we manage everything more from an execution side uh, and through that interface. Thank you for that. And then we're coming up on the end of our time here. Uh, one last question is, which ERP products do you work with? Well, I expected I opened up that question with my with my previous answer. Um, <laughs> the, uh, the interface... It, it works pretty much with any ERP solution that you have. Obviously, some we have more experience with, um, but we have an interface toolkit that will work um, with basically any SAPs, um, Oracles, those those types of solutions out there, or even legacy solutions. We can work with those. Um, but overall, we have the most implementation experience. We have standard interfaces, uh, which can be a large part of the project from a cost and implementation side. We have standard interfaces for, uh, for example, NetSuite, uh, the Sage suite of solutions, the, obviously the Microsoft Dynamics set, um, SAP Business One that, that works with the smaller businesses, smaller companies, um, one or two of the Infor solutions, and uh, a new one we have uh, is Acumatica. We've got an interface and, as well as QuickBooks. Wow, You're kind of covering the across the board there. Well, Chris, I want to thank you for sharing your time with us today. I want to thank our audience for their time as well. We hope you found this. Uh, time with us, uh, time well spent. Uh, to help Archer Point continue to offer value, we ask that you take a few minutes more to give us your feedback or send us any unanswered questions or uh, suggestions for future Lunch and Learn webinar topics. Uh, just simply send your comments to info at archerpoint.com. Again, that's info at archerpoint.com. Everyone will receive a link for the High Jump uh, ROI calculator in our follow-up email. We do thank you for your time, and this concludes today's session. Have a great rest of your day. Thank you.